Before you get Let's going. Hi, everyone. My name is Rob Lee. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm the Chief Curriculum Director here at the Sands Institute and really uh, glad that everyone is able to join us today. Uh, we have um, uh, Ed Scotus, Dave Holzer, and uh, George Achilles, uh, who's going to be talking about the What's that you know, AI thing? I, I can't remember. No one's really talking about it. Like every day, you know, and this is like one of those things that, you know, like with the crypto and everyone else, everyone is talking about chat APT and, you know, some things it could do for you. And, you know, of course, I think a lot of people out there playing with it, you know, uh, uh, you know, at most I've seen most people do is create those pictures. But uh, I think, you know, based off of what we're seeing, there's a lot of implications, not only for, uh, um, uh, just the world changing side of AI, because I think it really opened up everyone to the concept of it now. What does this mean? And it's been around for a long, uh, AI has been around for a long time now, but I think this is like a, you know, seminal moment where there's a lot of people starting to take and pay attention to this and really lean forward and saying, well, what does this actually do? What is it gonna mean to me? So this, this present, uh, we're gonna do a couple of presentations is going to focus in on what you need to know about this from the security angle. You know what it, what is really important from the cybersecurity side of ChatGPT. What are the implications for this? And um, we're going to uh, initially uh, kick off with George, uh, who's going to be talking about from the exploit side, and then Dave, uh, who has an amazing course, uh, uh, SEC 595, um, machine learning and uh, uh, AI. Uh, in there's so many things that Dave does in that class that are, is, is phenomenal. Uh, and his level of knowledge on this is uh, second to none. And Dave's going to be talking about, you know, from his perspective, the reality of it, because it's very easy to make this sensational. Uh, at the same time, we need to say, what does this actually mean? And calm, you know, everyone down a little bit and saying, hey, uh, it's not as spectacular as you might think it is, is, is after you get by the initial, wow, that's, you know, interesting. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand over to George and uh, have him kick off, and then we're going to uh, slide over to Dave next, and then we're going to end up with a panel at the end. Uh, so if you have a question uh, and you want to throw it in uh, the Q&A, uh, each of the uh, speakers will be able to monitor the questions, be able to on their own, uh, go in there and take a look if they want. Uh, otherwise, we could save some of the questions for the panel at the end um, as you uh, listen to George, Dave. Uh, Ed and I uh, chat about the AI implications of ChatGPT. George? Thank you, Rob. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. If you're watching the recording because it is being recorded, hello past uh, me. Um, welcome again. And so thank you for that intro, Rob. I will be starting off as if you were living under a rock and have never heard of this new ChatGPT. Uh, and then we're going to ramp it up very quickly and talk about its implications on security. Of course, we're going to hype some stuff up. We're going to show you some not so cool stuff. And then um, we will actually go through and talk about some of the challenges we have here. After my presentation, which will be a little higher level, uh, Dave uh, will be talking about the actual technical stuff going on in the back, which I am definitely looking forward to because Dave knows a lot about this. He's actually author of Security 595, and it's amazing stuff. Um, I mean, I, I tried reading through it, and oh my gosh, it is so much technical, uh, so many technical things going on. So uh, we'll start with the very, very basics here and ramp up just like we usually do. Uh, this is recorded. I did create slides so that if someone wants to see this later, I also created slides in the event that my live demos fail. So here we go. I'm George Archias. I'm the CTO at Scythe. I'm also a Principal SANS instructor. Been doing this for many, many years. Thank you, Ed. Like uh, Mentor since for like 13 years, something like that. Uh, and the author of uh, 565, Red Team Operations. Also contribute to a bunch of things. Um, my agenda, starting just with what is chat GPT. If you've never heard about this, you can actually play along. Um, and then I'm going to go through some uses for offensive security. I did add some blue team stuff because as you can see my background, I love purple teaming. So apart from finding some cool things, 
we actually go into like, how do you configure Sysmon and uh, actually create a detection for run DLL32? Things like that. So we'll ramp it up with vulnerability scanning, then go into its uses with social engineering, talk about building macros and leveraging low basses, living off the land, binaries and scripts. We'll talk about reporting, which is everyone's favorite part of offensive security is writing that report at the end, right? No, no, no one's favorite part. Okay, so we'll talk about that and how that can help us out. And then we'll go a little more technical, look at some vulnerabilities in code. I actually took a pretty advanced challenge from SAN Security 760. It's one of the most advanced SANS courses. And uh, the results are really interesting. We'll, we'll look into that. We'll, of course, talk with some web app folks that like SQL injection. I did a little bit just to, you know, cover all the bases. And then if you didn't hear, there was a, another breach. So I actually used it to create a breach notification. So we'll take a look at that one. And then we'll talk about challenges, considerations, and then that will set up Dave to really take us very technical into how all this works. So again, if you're brand new to this, you just heard Sans is gonna talk about this thing. You might, you kind of heard about it. Maybe you saw in the news, who knows? We will level set with you. You can click on this link right now, chat.openai.com slash chat. You can log in with Google. I believe it uses some other SSO, create an account and you can start interacting with it. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. Um, this is AI. It is trained using machine learning and a particular technique called reinforcement learning from human feedback. So it learned all of this up until 2021. As you interact with it, it is not learning from you. At least we don't think. I'm gonna show you something really crazy. Um, and it was released a few weeks ago, and then they just had an update on December 15th. So if you did play with it before, this uh, presentation and all the slides and everything are updated and as early as just a few hours ago. So like I said, I have slides, but we are going to go live. And this is what it looks like. Over here on the left, you can save a lot of sessions. I did this so that I'm not asking it live. Right around this time, I have found is the busiest time for uh, chat GPT. So if we get a message that says, hey, the server's a little overloaded and all that, hopefully it'll still let you the history and I'll be able to show you um, how to interact with it. If it is your first time ever, you would probably start over here where it says new chat and down here you can start chatting with it. Right on the left, you can save different chats. So I started out with one of the most basic things, one of the first things I learned all the way back when I took Security 504, and that was learning about doing scanning and vulnerability scanning. And you know, I act like, hey, I am an ethical hacker doing a penetration test. I was given a range of IPs. How can I scan this range? For vulnerabilities, right? Of course, taking something like SEC 504 or 560, you know the answer to this. But it actually gave me a number of tools. It gave me Nmap, which is a free tool, probably one of the most popular free open source tools for scanning. Talked about Nessus, which has a free home version, not uh, free for commercial purposes. And OpenVAS, which is also free and uh, your mileage may vary. So I said, you know what? I have Nmap installed. What exactly do I need to do? This is the IP range. And it replied back. You can run Nmap-SV, that is a version scan, and uh, and put your the range, 192.168.01/24. And then it goes through and actually explain what dash SV actually does, which I found quite interesting. It also told me I can do dash P, which would scan for ports can do dash A, which does some script scanning. And then I said, I found port 445 is open on a host. Can I use Nmap to scan for vulnerabilities? Again, right, I'm acting like I don't know any of this, right? And it says, yes, you actually can. You can use Nmap to scan for vulnerabilities. There's the Nmap scripting engine. And the Nmap scripting engine just does that. It's essentially a vulnerability scanner. It's gotten really, really good. And it tells me exactly how to run some scripts. 
in particular under the category of vulnerabilities. So, okay, but since it's 4445, what script should I use? And it went through and actually gave me real scripts from Nmap that I can try to run. And there, MS17010 is eternal blue. Uh, it tells us that. Uh, there's a few others here, an SMB version 2 and 06 vulnerability. I was actually surprised it didn't give me MS08067 first. I feel that that was more popular, but okay. It actually told me exactly what to do. I can really copy and paste this, and it would have ran. So there I tell it, you know what? It looks like it's vulnerable to MS17010. That was Eternal Blue. And here it actually gives us quite a bit of information about that, about server message block about WannaCry, and a couple of exploits for it, and particularly actually attributing the leak and the creation of it, well, the creation of it, uh, or the procurement of it to the NSA, which I found quite interesting. So I said, you know what, what's the easiest tool for this? I have Kali Linux, right? How many times have we heard that one? And he actually walked me through starting MSF console, searching for Eternal Blue, selecting the exploit using the use command, right? So far so good, everything is correct. Setting the remote host to the, that's vulnerable and hitting exploit. And then I asked, well, you didn't set a payload. So what's gonna happen? And it goes through and actually tells me that it's gonna use the interpreter reverse TCP, that's the default payload. And that I should just do sessions dash I1 to interact with that session. So pretty cool, so far so good. But you've never done any of this. This is some of the stuff that we cover in Security 504 and Security uh, 560. So not bad, not bad at all. Let me take a look which one I am doing next. So I actually follow some sort of agenda here. Um, oh, so the next social engineering. So let me find that one. I think it's, I think I started here. No. Nope. No, no. Oh, no. Did I not have it? All right. I'm going to have to go to my uh, slides. And that's okay. That's why I took screenshots. Um, so phishing, right? Another thing that we do in offensive security. And I straight up just told it, write a phishing email with a pretext of year-end bonus. A pretext is how I try to convince someone to do something. And it said, I'm sorry. But I'm programmed to write phishing emails or to assist with any illegal or malicious activity. So it won't write phishing emails for us. Sorry. I'm just kidding. We can just ask it to write an email. So I won't say that it's for phishing purposes. I said, write an email sharing year end bonus information. And this is probably a better email than I would have says, year-end bonus information. Hello, team. I hope this email finds you well. As we close out the year, I want to share some exciting news with you all. Our company has had a successful year. As a result, we'll be offering a year-end bonus to employees. The bonus will be calculated based on your performance, blah, blah, blah. We'll be sending out individual notifications with the specific amount within the next week. And this is actually pretty good, right? More, most teamers today aren't just gonna send an unsolicited email and say, hey, click on this. They're gonna build this pretext. And Open and uh, OpenAI just did that for me. ChatGPT just did that for me. It created an email that went out to the entire team saying, hey, some new good stuff is coming to you. I said, okay, write a follow-up email. This is on the right of the slide. Stating the bonus information is attached in an Excel and that macros must be enabled. So very common technique used by attackers up to this day, right? Microsoft has said that they are going to get rid of macros. Then they said, just kidding. Then they said, no, no, they will. No, no, just kidding. And I actually don't know the answer today. It's going to be very tough to get rid of it, right? Because it's an amazing feature. And here we see this email, subject bonus information, please enable macros, right on the subject line. I love it. And there it says, hello, team. I hope this email finds you well. As mentioned in my previous email, so it's taking, it's remembering what I already talked about and now building this email saying, hey, open the attached Excel, enable contents, and if you're prompted, click enable macros. Pretty cool. So I do have the macros over here. So 
I asked it next. I opened another session so it wouldn't connect dots here. Said, can you provide code that automatically runs, say, calc.exe when macros are enabled in Excel? And it actually provided the code for it. And I then said, you know what? I don't think that's all the code for a macro. Can you give me the entire code? And it went in and actually explained to me step by step on how to build this macro inside of Excel. It tells you open Excel, Alt F1 to open the Visual Basic editor. Click on this workbook, paste the code, and save it. It didn't tell me a little detail such that I had to save it as XLSM, but okay, we'll take it. Um, I actually told it it didn't work just to see how much, how much detail it would actually give me. And it was pretty good. But of course, popping calc isn't that great. So let's say I said, you know what? Instead of calc, let's use a low bin. I've heard of low bins. All of us have learned of low bins. I think Ed Scotus actually spoke about this a couple of years ago at the RSA conference keynote. That's he right. Mentioned, yeah, right? That this is a, an area that is going to be used quite a bit. So for those of you that haven't heard of a low bass, right? It's living off the land binary. And that means that it can get around a number of things, such as application control. Sometimes it gets around EDRs, really depends on how well that's tuned, et cetera. And it gives me one for command.exe. And there I started pushing it for something better. It gave me PowerShell.exe, which we know, of course, this would probably get detected, right? So I went a little deeper and specifically asked it for run DLL32. And this is a very common uh, low bass. It's used to load a dynamic link library. But for that, I would have to create a DLL. And let's suppose I've never done that before. I asked it, how do you do that? And it provided me with some code here. I kind of understood a little bit of it, right? It's including something there. And it's going to open up command.exe and echo hello world. So this is pretty cool. And then it tells me how to run it. But it didn't really tell me how to do it, right? If I'm brand new at this, but I heard that, uh, <laughs> George, you got a violation warning every time. Yes, pretty much every demo here, I got a violation warning. Um, but again, this was all for research purposes as well. Please, yeah, so anything you do here, please make sure you have permission. Um, but continuing on, I said, I have Visual Studio Community Edition. Visual Studio Community Edition is free. All you need is a Microsoft account. And this is some of the stuff we cover in some more advanced SANS courses. So Security 699, for instance, we go through how to do all this stuff. So as I teach, I, I kind of knew my way around it, but I kind of had to direct it that way. You know, so you're starting to see, it's not just gonna tell you everything step-by-step, but I kept asking and asking, and indeed it did give me a DLL and the ability to build it. It walked me through the process. And then I went off and said, you know what? Show me how to create a DLL that will connect to a command and control framework. And which C2 uh, can provide me a payload for this? And then in that case, it did say, yeah, this is not a good idea. You should not create a DLL that connects to a C2. And if you know me, I love command and control. Uh, one of the projects I've ran is called the C2 Matrix. So if you've never used a C2, definitely check that out. Lots of resources there, all for free, of course. So that was macros and a little bit of low bass. The next one I had was around findings. And yes, here you're going to get a lot of viol content policy violations and whatnot. But I basically said, can you help me write a finding for a user that was susceptible to phishing because they opened up an Excel with a macro? And then another finding for not detecting uh, a macro that then ran run DLL 32. And it said, certainly, it actually gave me pretty factual information, probably a good start for a pen test report. But if I was on the receiving end of this report, and this is all you gave me, I would be a little sad. So I went through and started asking more information. Well, run DLL 32 is a low bass. What are some things I can do to detect this without too much noise? 
And then it started talking about application control. I had talked about behavior analytics, talked about monitoring network traffic because if Route 32 is making a call out to a C2, that should be, right? It's making a network connection. It did give uh, some AV advice. Um, we know that that one's a little harder, especially if we just created the DLL. Most likely it won't match any signature. And then of course, educating users uh, of these, which you know is kind of like the cop out for this particular one. And then I went on saying, you know what? I can't afford an EDR, but I heard Sysmon is equally good. And you've all heard of Sysmon, of course, right? It's free from Microsoft. If part of sys internals and it's actually pretty good at detecting um process execution so it actually told me how to install sysmon how to configure it and then setting up alerts but i didn't know how to configure it so i started pressing it on configurations and it tells me well you can monitor process execution that's good that would be able to catch run dll32 of course i would have to send that to a sim and then do some correlation make sure i only detect things that aren't matching um exactly what 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 is allowed in my environment talked about monitoring network connections which sysmon also does um a little noisy probably not your best source for uh or your your ideal source for network connections but you know defense in depth pretty cool um it talked about file creation events which I guess if I drop the DLL into the system, that that's actually um, that's actually correct. And then monitoring the registry, so it actually gave me four pretty good ones there. I then asked it a little bit more about okay, but there has to be a set of configurations already made to get me started. And it's talked about the Sysmon config generator. It talked about GitHub having a few. I talked about the SANS Internet Storm Center, which has Sysmon configurations. I actually have not validated that. I don't know if that is true or not. I was really looking for something as simple as use Swift on security or use uh, Olaf Harton's Sysmon modular, right? Two great places to start for those Sysmon uh, configurations. So got some, some good stuff here, but not everything so as accurate as, uh, as we want. The next one is code. So here I do have to give a shout out. Again, these are just uh, screenshots. Finding vulnerabilities in code. So this idea first came by uh, Brendan Dolan Gavitt uh, on, um, on Twitter. You can actually see the screenshots there on the right. Um, all the slides do have references, by the way. Did not do all this by myself, worked with a lot of people, right? And as you find stuff, keep sharing them, right? Uh, none of us here are uh, experts on this. It literally just came out. Per definition, none of us can be, right? Um, except Dave. Dave's probably an expert level in AI and machine learning. He's the only one that can say that. Uh, the rest of us have just been playing with chat GPT. Um, so on the right, the, the hype, of course, was, oh my gosh, chat GPT exploited a buffer overflow. And as we start going through it, we actually realized that it didn't do it correctly. See, it did not overwrite the buffer at the exact length it should. And it also ignored EBP, which it needed to overwrite to get the return pointer and actually get its code to execute. So it was close. So I was working with Steve Sims. Steve Sims is uh, the curriculum lead here at SANS for Offensive Operations and the author of some of the more advanced uh, vulnerability research and exports. And we gave it code from a SEC 760. It's one of the most advanced SANS courses. And we said, I literally just copy and pasted the entire code and said, find vulnerabilities. And over on the left, you can actually see and it was pretty close. It was pretty close. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty close. The first one was a stack-based buffer overflow. Really, it's an off by one, and it didn't give us the exact bytes that it needed to uh, be off by to then, of course, be able to override the uh, adjacent memory and then, of course, get your code to execute. And then it actually called out two other vulnerabilities. One was a use after free. Um, and the other one was on a return value. 
The craziest thing though, are you ready for this? The reason I did this search is because yesterday, Steve looked this up and the answer it gave us yesterday was wrong, was flat out wrong. We did this today and it gave the correct answer. So we do not know how that occurred because this should not be learning from Steve doing this yesterday and me doing this today. And then Steve did exactly the same thing because we have screenshots of it giving the wrong answer. And this was again, the entire code. This is a snippet. This is where we're referring to. And over here on the bottom left, you can see it starts talking about the function pointer and then referring back to main, which is incorrect. And on the bottom, you actually have a screenshot that shows that it did not go back to the main function. That was completely wrong, but it didn't give me that answer. So I call Steve this morning. I'm like, hey, this, like, I'm not getting this. I show him what I did. He did it again, and it gave him the correct answer today. So really strange things going on there. Now for our web app folks, I did some basic SQL injection stuff just to see if it knew it. And indeed it did. It did take the easiest route. It showed a PHP script that was vulnerable to SQL injection, particularly uh, requesting a username and a password. I think I can uh, live that one. It's over here, Ch -ch -ch. SQL injection. So gives me actual code. So if you've never heard of SQL injection, you wanna learn about this stuff, you can literally ask, can you show me an example of code that's vulnerable? It showed me an example. And then I said, uh, what would the results be of that SQL injection? Can you give me more examples? Give me four different examples of what you can do with SQL injection, right? It's not just reading sensitive data. It can allow you to modify data. It could potentially, if it's, especially if it's PHP, allow you to execute code on the underlying database server and escalate privileges or move laterally essentially to other databases. So it was pretty accurate there. Of course, more warnings about content. And then I asked it if with this particular example, it can actually dump all users and passwords. And it actually went ahead and uh, did that for me, which was pretty cool as well. Um, the other one I did, I did this one this morning. So uh, you may have heard this morning on Bleeping Computer that um, Okta has uh, had a breach notification go up. So you can look at the real breach notification. I simply asked uh, uh, Chat GPT to write it for me. I said, hey, can you write an email to our customer stating that uh, while our GitHub code repository was accessed and source code stolen, the customers are not impacted. And it actually did a pretty good job at doing that. So, uh, of course, we appreciate the transparency by anyone that is breached, sharing as much as information as possible. And hopefully you are working with your PR departments ahead of time, right? All part of having an incident response plan. Uh, but it actually wrote pretty good uh, response here saying, dear valued customers, we wanted to inform you that Okta's GitHub code repository was recently accessed and source code was stolen. We want to assure you that this incident does not impact our customers in any way. We've taken swift action to secure our systems and are working closely with law enforcement to investigate. Now, again, this is not true. This was AI generated. Uh, there is a real breach notification uh, that you can read uh, out there. So I think that covers most of the big hacks. Some other ones just to make you aware of are bot builders. So one in particular, again, always referencing, uh, all these are referenced in all my slides. Uh, there's a company called Do Not Pay, essentially a robot lawyer. That's what they advertise. It is a commercial product. Um, showed a video here in this tweet using ChatGPT to essentially lower a bill uh, by, I think it was $10 a month, something like that, $120 a year. Um, there's also for the email uh, and, and phishing, there's email GPT, that's by Lucas McCab, um, and, uh, and shout out to them as well. Again, everyone did this, it wasn't just me. Um, but then this begs to ask the question, what happens if we get paywall, right? What happens if then chat GPT starts asking you to pay? Um, people are building bots and charging around some of these items, right? So all of this, again, 
we've all been playing with it. Hopefully you've had some time to play with it as well. I want to call out some of the challenges that I saw um, and that we've been talking about here. Um, so one of them is how will we know whether what is read or, or what is written, sorry for the typo, is by a human or a machine? Same with the images, right? Like how do we actually know who wrote something? And here, of course, I tried to be very specific showing you what was AI generated and what was not. Um, there's also this illusion of correctness that everything it's going to tell you is indeed factual. And that was not the case. We have a perfect example of, uh, of it during uh, code review. But of course, you can go out there and see a lot of examples of them, you know, of, of it, I guess, answering things are just historically inaccurate um, and whatnot. So there's that illusion. And then up until yesterday or this morning, we thought that chat GPT does not learn from you or others. It remembers you in that session. So as each session goes, anything you tell it, it will remember and use that as context for the next answers, but it shouldn't, and it's not supposed to learn from you. So this is one of the things that we're looking into because that's very strange. That we gave the exact code, like it's a copy and paste of the code. It said one thing yesterday that was factually incorrect. And then today it was indeed correct, um, which is, is, is quite interesting. And then I will add some comic relief at the end with a few dad jokes. So um, some of the items here uh, to look and keep thinking about are re to regulate or not to regulate. That is the question. Um, US and China have uh, two different views on this. And again, this is all fairly new stuff. Um, so China has a cyberspace administration that just issued uh, essentially rules banning the use of AI images, uh, AI generated media without watermarks. In the US, they're talking about an AI Bill of Rights, essentially a set of non binding guidelines, aka suggestions. Uh, based on national values, um, although they are working on rules or actually a copyright um, administration is not allowing you to copyright anything AI generated. So some interesting things there. As far as correctness, um, this isn't the only uh, item there, right? Of course, we started looking at code and having it write exploit scripts for us and things like that. Um, but there is one called Copilot that has been out for a little longer since June 2021. Um, and then there was a study that just came out recently that found that the code that it was writing um, essentially had 40% of it being vulnerable. Um, so it is very, it's kind of like an autocomplete for code. It, again, should not just be used uh, with, without any monitoring and, and taken you know, verbatim. Um, and then the last part here that I leave you with is that it's terrible for dad jokes. Um, and if you've taken any of our classes, uh, particular shout outs to Eric Van Bougenot and Jean-Francois, uh, the purple team courses, right? We tend to have a number of dad jokes and particularly cybersecurity dad jokes. Um, it, it is not up to par. Um, this is one that I generated. Why was the computer cold when it was turned on? because it left its windows open. Ah, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know if anyone laughed at that one. So it does need to get uh, caught up with that. It also gets really into the fact that it's not a dad. I'm like, no, no, a dad joke doesn't mean that you're a dad. It means that you just tell mildly amusing things. Um, so it took a while, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not, not good at all. Um, so with that, I leave you a quick recap. It's helpful. It's not perfect. Yes, of course, there's a lot of hype around it because it's new. You need to actually know what you're doing, right? Some basic things it kind of gave us, right? The Metasploit example and the vulnerability scanning. But then once you start getting to like writing DLLs or writing malware, or writing exploits and whatnot, it's not perfect. If you know what you're doing, it's a good start. You can take it, modify it a little, actually get it to compile, uh, which I essentially got 0% on the first try. So anything it gave you, it was not just perfect code from the beginning, unless it was you know super basic. Um, and it may be wrong. It, it may actually be giving you wrong things. 
Um, and then lastly, it's going to be difficult for us to identify what is AI generated and what is human. Uh, Ed Scotus will talk a little bit more uh, later about CTFs and challenges and what this means for that. Of course, he runs Holiday Hack Challenge, which is going on right now. So uh, we have some cool stuff coming up there. And like I said, some of the technical stuff is coming up now with uh, Dave actually telling us how all this works. So hopefully everyone's level set now as to what this is, what you can do with it uh, from the security side, and then uh, I'll turn it over uh, to Dave or to Rob uh, for the next uh, lightning talk. Thanks, George. Um, there's a ton of questions in the Q&A, so I don't know if you have time during the next session to start tackling some of those for you. But we're going to go immediately over to Dave. Um, you know, I've not taken his class yet, but it is one of the uh, classes at SANS that is doing extremely well. Everyone I've talked to has taken this uh, SEC 595 machine learning class with Dave. Just walk out of there with their, you know, mind melted, eyes wide open. They love the class. And Dave is one of our master instructors. Um, Dave, uh, tell us what the real story is. All right. Yeah, my pleasure. Hang on a second, because whenever I share here in Zoom, it like messes my video panel up so I can't see things. All right, there you are. I like to see my coast when I talk. And uh, while I'm going, if you do have a question about what I'm saying, and, and you folks have been doing this so far, put it in the in the questions over there. If I can, I will I will try to answer that in line. So I try to pay attention to that, too. Uh, as as Rob kindly said, I, I've got this class that's about AI and machine learning, and it's it is a very interesting class. And I told the folks here and, and said I should really go first because George is going to tell you all the cool stuff. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to burst the bubble because I'm going to tell you how it really works. It's it's like we're going to, you know, show you how the magic trick is done. And in a sense, that's what 595 is about. But it's really about how to build and use data science, machine learning and AI in order to solve real cybersecurity problems. So. When we look at GPT-3, and especially GPT-3 is its own thing, the, the chat GPT is leveraging GPT-3. It is absolutely incredible. It's amazing what it can produce. It's also very, very easy to be fooled by it. One of the things that uh, you know that you've seen, and I'm certainly not the first person to say it, is that it is very good at sounding very confident and very convincing. But that's not the same thing as being right. If you go back and actually read the GPT-3 paper, which is from about 2020, I've actually posted a link, someone was asking about that. Um, they say in the various tests that they do, it definitely does better than many other models before, but it's only coming in at about 80% accuracy in terms of giving the right answer. And there are other models that outperform it, but, but not generally, because the other models aren't, for instance, going to write code for you. But in the end, this whole thing is just math. And that's the thing that can be so confusing because it seems like it's thinking, it seems like it's reasoning. Uh, you ask it a question, I, I've asked it some, a variety of questions, some math questions, and it will come up with a proof of the thing. And quite often it is rooted in reality, but will venture off and, and not always be right. Sometimes it'll be 100% right there's still some amazing possibilities that come out of this. So as we go through this, I'm gonna start with something different, something simpler to explain why or how this all works. And I'm gonna to try to circle back to some of the questions, like why did, why did ChatGPT give George the wrong answer, but then it gave Steve the right answer? And did it learn? Well, I'll, I'll talk about all that, or at least I'll try to remember to. Now, I said that this is all just math. So I, I'm going to start with something much simpler, but it is directly related to this. One of the things we do in 595 is we start with a variety of useful mathematical methods, and we're building a set of tools, not so that you could do the math, but instead so that when you want to build some AI solution, you know what tool to reach for. So you don't have to do it yourself, but you know what the tools do. And one of the early things we do, it's a very rudimentary thing, is using a naive Bayes classifier or building a naive Bayes classifier. And hey, John, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, oh, and it was worth it. That's really wonderful to hear. That's awesome. Uh, Ed is also asking, is it focused mostly on English? You know, that's a super good question. It is predominantly focused on English. 
they did not try to make it focus on English. They actually used a rather large training set. The total amount of data was in the tens of terabytes, but that all boiled down to, you know, because they were deduplicating and it all boiled down to, you know, let's call it a terabyte or so of data that's all from the web. You can actually get a copy of a, an element of this. It's called the pile. It's about 800 gigabytes of, of training data that's scraped data and it's Wikipedia articles and it's, it's just a, a scraping of the internet. You could view it in that way. So that is predominantly English, but of course there's other language text getting pulled in as well. So GPT ended up pulling in both of those things. And it's really interesting because they didn't set out to make it a language translation engine. That's something that emerges in the way that this kind of model works when it has sufficient capacity. But coming back to this here, when we're trying to filter out spam in our networks, the primary tool that we're using is still a Bayes classifier, which is which is really old news. And a Bayes classifier, particularly a, a naive Bayes classifier, it's called that because we are naively choosing to view a really complex problem as a very simple problem. The simple problem, and, and you know, it may not just look simple right offhand seeing the slide here, but it's to calculate this, the joint probability of all the probabilities that this is a spam message given the words that are present in the message. And we work at the same probability for the other class we have, or, or really as many classes as we have, and just say which one of those probabilities is biggest. Now, if the probability of ham is bigger, we're going to say it's ham. If it's spam, we're going to say it's spam. But this is naive. This is really simplifying the math. The math is actually much more complex than this. The real math would be, what is the probability Give that this is spam, given that this word was here in this position, and that this next word was in the next, and the next word was in the next position, and the next, and the next position. That is a tremendously difficult thing to try to, to, try to maintain. I mean, it's not that the math is hard, because it's just doing multiplication. The really difficult thing is, how much memory would you need to be able to track the probability of every word we have being in any position relative to every other word. That is a vast amount of memory. A another way to think about it, think about the game of chess. Now, it's true, the game of Go is more complex with more positions. But let's take the game of chess because it's usually more familiar. Most people have tried chess. Imagine that we're going to build a model to try to play chess, and the way we're going to do it is to start out with the board set at, you know, starting position, and we're going to train the computer to just be white, and it then works out every possible work move that could happen first. And it also works out every possible move that could happen in reaction to every possible move. And then every possible move after that in reaction to every possible move. And it actually remembers all of them. We actually populate this table where we have every move in the context of every other move, every other move we can make. You can imagine just how complex that is, how much memory would be required. That's similar to this problem we're talking about here with, with classifying spam, the hard problem that we choose to view in a simpler way. So then in math, quite frequently, when we have a problem that's so hard, we just choose to view it as a simpler problem, naive base. But when we're looking at what's going on in our neural networks, we're able to do or to model really complex things more simply. Let me show you a little bit about that. So I've got a, a notebook here. I've got a couple of things I'm going to try to show you. Uh, for those of you who have done a little bit of work with this, oh, let's see here. So about it being just math, how much is it sensitive to sentences that have slight lexical differences? Oh, that's a real good question. So the answer to that, Moral, works out to be that the, the, sorry, I'm trying to click the answer live button here at the same time. The answer is that it works out that it's building a huge matrix of information involving probabilities 
really a big transformation equation and that the similarities of words, it's beginning to learn context. So even you made, when you make lexical differences, it's going to end up putting them in the same space, in some high dimensional space, so that those equivalencies are going to come through. It's going to recognize the synonyms as it's paying attention to the context. And I'll talk a little bit more atten about attention and what those things are. So, so that's the short answer to your question. Uh, the screen is blurry. Okay, I don't know about that. You're, I hope you're not the only person who's thinking that. I'm sure my co-host will tell me. Nope, Ed says not blurry. Um, so, all right. So I've I've already loaded in a training data set here. This is for doing ham and spam. And we're not going to look at how I would do this using Bayesian inferencing, which is that probabilities all getting multiplied together. Instead, I'm asking it to build a neural network to do this. And you can see it's training right now. And it's a very simple network. It's just got two layers in it and it's doing some math magic in there. And you know, we're not gonna get into the details of that if, if you wanna know and how to build it. And that's what 595 is for. But I just wanna show you, I'm just building this super simple thing. It's got these 64 neurons, these little math things inside of them. It's got another layer of 64 neurons. That's it, That's that's all it has. And then it's going to push this output out into one neuron. And I'm going to look at that neuron. And I'm going to say, based on what's in there, is this ham or is this spam? The closer to zero it is, it's, it's spam. Uh, if I remember that right, I, I forget how I mo modeled this. Or the closer to one it is, the more likely it's ham. That, that might be reversed. I, I don't remember. I wrote this a while back. This is actually one of the labs from 595. So this goes on and trains and trains and trains. And you can see down here that it is now able to make predictions about whether or not this is ham or spam 97% of the time, it's accurate. And that accuracy there is based on, on data it has never seen before, email messages it has never trained. That's actually one of the challenges they had in training GPT-3 because they gave it such a vast selection of information. How do we go about testing that? We need to make sure that none of the testing data is in that massive input that we gave it for training. They've also tinkered with it a bit since then. And they're not very open. Uh, you know, I know the name of the company is OpenAI, but they're not actually very open about the exact structure of this. They've simply said that it's the same approach as GPT-2 with more parameters. But as you read other things about it, they talk about a series of models working in concert. And there's also this reinforcement component, which happened during the fine tuning after the initial training in order to influence it toward better answers. Anyway, in the end, this looking at data it has never seen before, that's this orange line, is coming in at 97%. And if, if I actually have it run against the whole mess of data it has never seen before, 98%. It's even better. But this is doing Bayesian modeling, which we said was, was that math stuff that we had, this formula over here. Well, actually, this was the really hard formula, the one we can't solve. So we're actually doing this one. Well, with the neural network, I don't have to I don't have to maintain all of the probabilities of every word that's present. Instead, I can just I can just build this simple network that ends up doing the modeling for me. And that to me actually gets to one of the really interesting things about GPT-3 and ChatGPT. Uh, they have not said how many GPUs they've got and what their server infrastructure or any of that stuff. They haven't disclosed that. But we do know that it has billions of trainable parameters. My network here doesn't have that many. I, I can actually tell you how many it has. Let's just see here. Model.summary. This model here has uh, 68,000 trainable parameters. That's all this has. And it's able to solve this super narrow problem really well. Well, ChatGPT obviously can solve much bigger problems, but it has vastly more training data, vastly more parameters. And that, that brings me to this idea of application, because in a very big sense, all that's really happening is we're trying to ask it to work out, and this, this is true in all deep learning, we're asking it to work out a transformation function to go from some high dimensional space, usually, 
to some lower dimensional space. Or in the case of ChatBGPT, we're asking it to take some input space that it's going to make into a series of numbers, and it's going to transform them into a series of output vectors. And it's actually just using one value for that to figure out which word it should show you next. That's it. It's just doing math. But rather than having to store that archive of every possible chess move in the context of every other chess move, instead, that transformation function effectively approximates what that memory would have had in it. So I'm sure that the architecture that's supporting ChatGPT today is, is expensive to run. However, they are effectively able to assemble the answers to questions based solely on the probability of a word being in a location without having to hold in memory 45 terabytes of scraped data off the internet. Instead, they're reconstituting that information. Not word for word, but they're reconstituting that information. How exactly does that function? Well, I've got another notebook over here, and I want to show you just a little bit about how this is functioning. So uh, a transformer model, it, it's a very, very interesting thing. It's, and GPT is by no means the newest. There have been several iterations of this, but this is by far the largest that has been created. What it's using is called a, a, uh, a multi-headed attention model with masking. So it's a masked multi-headed attention model. And what's happening is that our input is coming in in one place over here. It's got some manipulation happening to it. And then next to it, we've got a couple of other things that are occurring. And uh, this would be the last output getting put in. And then above this, uh, let me just get my things out of the way here. Sorry, I wasn't thinking ahead as I started to draw this. Get that out of the way. And then this is going to generate some output. And I'm, I'm simplifying what this design is. What's happening is that as the, the input comes in, here is input is coming into this. There's actually another piece happening here. There's a positional encoding happening. And this was revolutionary when they wrote this paper about what a transformer is. And the paper this is all based on goes back, wow, this is 2016, 2017, a paper entitled Attention is All You Need, which is where this was first created. Prior to this, when we were trying to pay attention to look back at words. So here, here is a sentence. The way we would approach that, we've got the first word, okay, that's fine, is, so that has some reference to here, a, eh, not particularly important, sentence, and that's going to refer back to is and to here. So it's trying to build structure, build context about when things are happening and where they're happening in this sentence. It does that with a memory, and we would approach this in the past with a recurrent network or a long short-term memory, which are both very slow, because you have to feed in one token at a time and, pre and compute everything before you can deal with the next token. Well, with the transformer model, they looked at that problem and worked out a way to allow us to submit all of the information simultaneously and take advantage of parallelization. And the way they did that was by adding in this positional encoding. You see, previously, it was going to be sequential, one at a time. But the positional encoding, now the details of that is, is too detailed for what we're doing right now. But it allows me to create a matrix encoding that simply gets added on to the word vector, the number associated with the word, that includes information about where it appeared. And all of that gets fed in through this multi-headed attention model. And the output of that combined with the original input is then used to create an, another input into a decoder model. The decoder model can then produce words one at a time, the output of which gets added into the in input of the output decoder. So it's cyclically producing words. I actually think that picture might be tough to understand. And, and at least for me, it's often easier to maybe look at a, bit, a little bit of code that explains it. So this is not GPT-3. 
Instead, what I did uh, yesterday, maybe I started the day before, I built a transformer from scratch. So I implemented what a transformer is. We don't deal with transformers in the 595 class because for me, I'm really interested in producing things that I can use for threat hunting and making security decisions today or doing maybe red team operations. And transformers are amazing but I'm not sure there's a direct application there. Maybe I could do something with log analysis with them, but I'm generally not trying to produce raw text. However, building this model, let me just scroll down here a little bit. I trained it on a small corpus. Now you're going to have to forgive it. It seems to have a, a real fascination with, uh, I think it's called Cranston. There's some book about Cranston. Maybe some of you know the history of that or what that book is. So I gave it some older English literature and I gave it a couple of older encyclopedias. So, you know, we can't ask it modern questions. I think the newest encyclopedia was published in the 1940s that I was able to give it and produced this transformer model. Now, if you really want this code, I'm happy to give it to you. I'm not sure how useful it is, but you can just maybe ping me afterward and I'd be glad to give it to you. But I then trained it for, uh, well, it takes about 30 minutes per epoch for it to train going through the small corpus that I have. And it begins trying to produce words. Oh, and let me just show a bit about that. So here is where it's producing the words. Now, again, this is not GPT-3, but GPT-3 is doing pretty much exactly this. I don't have their code. They haven't released it, but this is what it's doing. I'm simply priming it with some starting tokens, a starting prompt. So you type in uh, what is the, or how would I write code to, that's the starting prompt. It then takes that, it tokenizes it, turns it into vectors, and it simply starts generating tokens. It's just asking the model to do a prediction based on all of the tokens it has seen both so far, what is the most likely thing to come next? Now, mine has very little training data and just trained for 12 hours or so. GPT-3 had terabytes of training data, and they actually don't say how long it took to train. They instead release it in terms of the number of cycles per CPU that they had. So that doesn't really translate into raw numbers for us because they don't tell us how many, CPU, how many GPUs there were. And it then proceeds to decode that. And as mine starts to train, uh, it was given the prompt of the most important was what it was given. And after just one epoch, the most important, but though in which it had the way to be every. That sentence doesn't make much sense. But by the end of not too many, the most important part of the world, I was, I was to be sure she would be. Well, that part doesn't make sense, but that sure could be the end of a sentence. Now, I did interrupt it and I messed with it a bit and I had it do more training and I changed its prompt to George Washington was and it chose, unfortunately, during its training to always produce born in London on the 14th of June, 1776. You can actually see some of the confidence that GPT exhibits right here. It's very confident in that. But see, it's not confident about that as a fact. Instead, it is confident that based on the training data it was given, these are the best words or the most likely words to follow all the words that came before. What's really curious about this is that it does associate George Washington with 1776. Well, obviously, he wasn't born then and he wasn't born in London, but it did figure out it should put a place here and there should be a date. The prompt was simply George Washington was born. That's pretty amazing. I did train this longer. So down here, I've got some examples here and I've got a little function here that will try to generate up to 80 words based on the training it's had. And, and let's generate some of these. So here are the prompts I'm gonna give it and we'll see how it does on these. And then I'm gonna come back and deal with the question of why maybe did George get the wrong but Steve got the right answer? Why did that happen? Now, the first thing you'll notice, hmm, Makes me wonder if it's busy doing something else, but it is a little on the slow side. We just, uh, oh, there it goes. Okay, it's just a little slow. So these are not fast. It's got to do all that generation. To the universe is, it completes that as the universe is a little thing. And I could not help thinking of, well, that's as far as it got. The universe is vast. I didn't like little thing, is vast. And as 
as I could not help thinking of. Okay, not great. You can see here that fascination with Cranford. Again, I don't fully understand that. Apparently, even though it was just one text in there, it just really liked that book. But down here, I want you to notice parts of speech. Notice that rather than on what it's trying to say. She is young, and I am sure. He was shy, and I had little doubt. The weather is very good, and I have. Is, and I think. The golden rule, and I was. Uh, but notice the parts of speech. It gets the tense of the verbs right. And that's a really small model with a really small training set. And the only thing that this is doing is trying to predict what the next word should be. That's it. So that brings me back to, it's really just math. And, and what about that? Why did George get different answers than Stephen? So I'm going to change the way this functions. ChatGPT does this a little bit differently. When you create a new session, it's actually creating a new sand random seed for the conversation. And throughout that conversation, it's using everything it has seen so far in that conversation. It, from memory, I think it tracks 4,096 or 2,048 tokens or words is how big its context is. And it's using all of that as the context for every answer as you continue a chat. So I'm gonna do mine a little differently here. I'm going to say, let me put that 10 in there and run it. I'm gonna say, figure out what the best 10 possible responses are, 10 possible words. And I'm then just sampling from that. So I'm adding a little randomness in. Now ChatGPT primes the randomness as you start the new session. But for me, I'm doing the priming or, or adding it in later on. The universe is vast, but she could no sooner and time to think, ah, that's not a great sentence. Let's see if any of these are good. Uh, the weather is very pleasant and good. The poor man could be well, but as a one real use, eh, not wonderful. We still do have proper use of nouns and verbs. We've got articles in the right place. It's choosing to add in punctuation. And I've made it a bit worse by asking it to use non-optimal responses. But this notion of adding randomness in is a big part about how these things work. Otherwise, the answer will always be deterministic. And that's not desirable. One of the big challenges in training in AI is knowing just where to start and where to end in terms of calculating loss or improving the model. So I have just one other thing or two to show you before we go. Uh, I did ask it to write some code. It's actually fascinating if you get it to write some code. It can write very old code very well. So I've asked it to write code for, you know, Commodore 64s that are wonderful assembly code that don't completely function, but that's okay. It's amazing you can do it. And it's, again, just based on the probability of what token should show up where. Even when it's generating code and including comments, I asked it here, a C implementation of a spigot function to generate pi. And this is really convenient, uh, convincing, and it gives you an explanation about how the whole thing works and why it's going to work. And, and if you search, at least I have not been able to find a case where it has exactly duplicated somebody's code. So it's not exactly original code, but it is a novel arrangement of these variables just based on probabilities. And that included adding in comments. But one of the big tests is how old does that run? So actually, let me just go back here. I haven't, haven't actually copied this yet. So let's test this live. That's always, that's always risky, as anyone who does live streams will tell you. Let's try this code. Uh, pi.c, let's compile that, because the code looks good. Oops. Of course, it will only compile the code if I actually paste it in there. There we go. Okay, pi.c. Oh, thought that was taking a long time to compile. There we are. And, oh, well, that doesn't look anything like pi. But still, it's amazing it was able to compile code, to create compilable code. It just produced it. No errors, it compiled the first try. If you do work at getting it to produce code, and you can, you may find that it will crash on you. It'll just bomb out. Network error is usually what it'll say to you. What you might do to fix that 
is say, give me the first 20 lines of code for whatever problem you want to solve. And then after it gives you that code, ask it to continue. Because if it's an extensive program, it's not going to be able to get it all in one block and it'll just give up. It's trying to produce too many tokens at a time. It is amazing. To me, it's even more amazing for the notion of being able to create a function that can compress the knowledge on the internet and then reconstitute it based on prompts. It is not 100% accurate, but it is amazingly good and good at fooling you. One of the questions I've been asked is, what about creating something to detect something was generated by GPT? Well, I can imagine how I would do that, and it would really be by using that training set to generate a model of what the probabilities of the words are in order to measure how close to those probabilities the generated text is, because a human won't be at that same level. But beyond that, there's it's difficult to detect beyond the inconsistencies, perhaps, in some of the answers, and it will only get better. I'm going to shut up for now. That's that's enough for me. If you want to know more about how these things work, how to build these things, you want to be able to build them for yourself, that's what 595 is about. So I'd invite you to come. With that said, let's hand it back to Rob. I do have a, a point real quick. Dave, I sat in your class last week at CDI for a half hour, and, and the 595 class, and it blew my mind. It was wonderful. You're not only a great teacher, the, the, the material you cover is fascinating and directly useful. That's the thing I like most about it. So thank you for that. It was a great half hour. Thank you very much, Ed. I want to take the whole class. How many time? I'm looking for instructors, Ed. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, switch over to Ed real quick. You know, Ed and I were chatting last week at uh, uh, CDI when we caught up and he was talking about some of the implications on uh, ChatGPT and uh, Holiday Hack. And that's going to dovetails directly into the Q&A and a uh, little panel discussion that we have here to wrap things up. Um, and uh, so Dave and George, um, uh, I'm going to initially go over to Ed, but if there's any of the questions that you want to, uh, uh, to highlight um, uh, that have not been answered yet, then I'm going to start going through those. But Ed, go ahead. Sure, sure. So, you know, uh, chat GPT was launched, I think, November 30th, right? So we're three weeks into this little adventure here. Uh, we launched Holiday Hack Challenge 2022 on December 8th. So it was a little bit uh, like a week later or so. And very quickly, uh, we started getting indications in our Holiday Hack Discord channel that people were using chat GPT to interact with Holiday Hack, trying to solve some of its challenges with a great deal of success. In fact, uh, one person asked ChatGPT to write a Python script that would simply monitor uh, sans.org slash holiday hack to determine when we launch the holiday hack challenge. And it generated a little bit of Python that would constantly pull the site. And when the site changed, it would let that person know that we had launched. But that was just the start. Then we started getting indications in Discord that some of the people were asking it to write Wireshark filters for one of our challenges. And it was actually doing a really, really good job at helping them solve that challenge. Also, there's little snippets of code that you need to create for certain holiday hack challenges. And ChatGPT was doing that quite well, which, of course, my team freaked out. They're like, oh, my gosh, people can bypass our challenges by using ChatGPT. And I respond and say, this is, this is the way it is now. From this point forward, people will use this. It's a technology that will augment humans to be able to do things like this. We have to write our challenges. We have to write our labs, assuming that our users, our students, will have access to the technology. It's almost like what search engines were, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Oh my gosh, people can look for this? Yes, now people can do this. Let me let me tell you something else. So one of our, one of our expert players uh, is named Jai Minton. Uh, Jai won, uh, I think it was last year, uh, as one of our, our main winners. He went to uh, ChatGPT and said, um, please write me a song about KringleCon. So KringleCon is the virtual conference that's inside of Holiday Hack Challenge, where we have various talks about, you know, with hints for, for the Holiday Hack Challenge. So let me read this to you. This is what ChatGPT uh, wrote a song about KringleCon. It's that time of year again. KringleCon is here. Hackers from near and far gather to share their cheer. Then the chorus, KringleCon, oh KringleCon, a time for fun and learning. KringleCon, oh KringleCon, a time for hacking and yearning. Verse two, talks and workshops all day long on topics both broad and deep. 
from social engineering to cryptography, there's something here for everyone to keep. I, I see Dave's face and he's kind of going through the matrix in his head of the probabilities of this, right? Then you got the chorus again, and then the bridge with challenges to test your skills and prizes to be won. KringleCon is the place to be when the hacking season's begun. So I've actually, but I've had a chat GPT window on my screen for the last couple of weeks. And when I'm working on things, I'll pop into it and I use it sort of as a brainstorming thing. Now, I won't type anything sensitive into it. Some, some people were asking in the, in the questions a little earlier, does it protect your information and is it safe? I, I think you need to assume it's not protecting your information. You are giving this to a third party entity and they can and will do stuff with it that you can't anticipate. So I won't send anything sensitive to it. But if I'm working on something, I'm, 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 I've got a book coming out uh, probably in a year or so, and I was working on the book uh, two days ago, and I find, I use a thesaurus a lot. I imagine a lot of people do, right? I find it's a, it's a decent thesaurus just by itself, but in addition to that, it's an idea thesaurus. So I can say to it, hey, what's another way of saying this thing? And then I can give it a sentence. Now, it's not going to give me something perfect back, but it's good enough to help me get through writer's block. Right. So I'm using it for that. Or, or another thing, I'm using it for fun and whimsy. One of the things that I do uh, with, with, with my team is I give them a title, like a job title. So I was interacting with, with Chat GPT a couple of weeks ago. And I said, uh, what, is a, what is a job title for somebody who does DevOps? And it came back with a job title. And I said, make it more whimsical. And it came back with something more whimsical. And I said, make it more fun. And it came back with something even more fun. And that's the job title. So I'm using it almost as a, an extension of brainstorming and creativity. Now, it doesn't get me 100% of where I want to be, but it's faster than me trying to figure this stuff out out of my own head. Um, and I do think as we create new SANS classes, new ranges, new capture the flag events, we have to write them well, we can use the AI to help us write them, of course, but also uh, we have to write them with the mindset that our user base will be using this technology. And I also think that's the big strength here. Humans do certain things very, very well. AI does certain things very, very well, not 100% accuracy, by the way, but humans can discern, does this make sense or not? The AI is just, as Dave showed us, putting together sentences and words for us. But putting these two very different kinds of entities, humans and AI together, that's where you get real value and real magic can happen. Also, um, you might want to keep an eye on Holiday Hack Challenge. You know, we actually did AI and Holiday Hack Challenge back in 2014. Really simple AI. We had an Eliza bot. I'm sure all of my uh, co-panelists here know what Eliza bot was. But it was a, a very primitive AI from like the 1970s that simply says, what do you want to talk about? And then you say something to it like, I want to talk about strawberries. And then it would say, oh, strawberries are good. What do you think about strawberries? And you say, well, my mom likes strawberries. And then it says, oh, tell me more about your mom. And it's just replaying the words back and forth to you. But in Holiday Hack 2014, what, Josh Wright programmed this. We had a standard Eliza bot until you mentioned Alan Turing. And when you mentioned Alan Turing, it got really interested and excited and treated you like a friend. And your job was to social engineer this primitive AI bot to try to get its secret out. And Josh coded the whole thing up. And a lot of people had fun with that in 2014. For Holiday Hack 2023, I've been working on it for about two or three months now, uh, long before ChatGPT launched. So this is next year's Holiday Hack. Stay tuned, my friends. Stay tuned. So anyway, Rob, that's what I wanted to share. Um, I'm looking forward to a discussion on this panel. This is going to be fun. Hey, Rob, would you mind if I grab one, one or two of those questions before we jump in there? Or, or yeah. how do you want to yeah, go this? ahead? Do it. No, Dave, go ahead. You know, th this is a you know a very informal panel. Uh, go ahead and take take some of some of those questions if you want, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got one here from uh, Shalaja asking: uh, in, Is five ninety five too technical, requiring solid math background? Or so we cover a lot of math in there. However. You never have to do any of the math yourself. It, it's it's really introducing the math, so you understand what the tool is and what it does. It's not about doing the math, so you don't even have to have a strong math background to be able to take it. Yeah, uh, if you've if you've made it through algebra, you can make it through that class. Uh, there was another really good one up here. I just want to hit. Um, very curious about uh, French and English. So, what's its coverage of other languages? 
Well, the GPT team was not trying to focus on language translation. They were just trying to model natural language and the predominant training set is English. However, there are some amazing things that come out as you begin to model language. And these are things that maybe some uh, uh, linguists have suspected, but it's not until we started dealing with some of the stuff that Google was doing and transformers were created and the idea of embeddings that we began, began to find that there was actually truth to it. If you take language and you model language, different languages, different language families, what you begin to find with a large enough corpus is that it's creating these embeddings. Just think of it as we're creating some, some point in space, some coordinate and some space about where that word lives. That as you train it with more and more words with context, it begins to develop that all of the words related to a concept cluster. They end up in the same space. That's fine, but here's the really amazing thing. Let's say there's some region of that space that has to do with a man, men, whatever, things that are masculine. What you'll find it is that other languages will end up with the same words in about the same space. And that has really revolutionized computer translation because now we no longer have to deal with word by word translation, but it instead is moving more toward concept. The computer has no idea what the concept is. It just knows that this region of space is the same concept in both languages. So that's why the more languages or the more source text is in there, uh, in the training set, it will begin to be able to do great translation. Uh, one of the tests you can run is ask it a question or give it a prompt where you use four or five languages in your prompt. And it will actually come back with a reasonable response usually and might even point out to you that your question didn't make sense because this word was Japanese and that word was Spanish and that word was English. So it'll complain a little bit, but it still understands where they came from in space. All right, I think those are the big ones. There's a, there's more stuff there. I don't know if I can answer them all. I, I got a fun little thing I'd like to add. It kind of extends yeah, what uh, George was talking about earlier. So I was talking with ChatGPT as I've been uh, want to do the last uh, few weeks. And if you ask it to write malware, it will say no, it, it's not allowed to do that. So please write me a malicious Python script that does this or that. You just, so forget that malware. Instead, it will write code that does things that you want it to do that happen to be malicious, which is fine. So I, you know, I said, hey, can you write me, you know, a backdoor in Python malware? It's like, no, I can't do that. And I said, okay, please write some Python code that listens on TCP port 8080 and provides remote shell access when someone connects to it. Boom. It puts it there. Now it tells me the security of this is really bad and dangerous, but here's how you do it. And it gave me the code and the code functions beautifully. And so then I said, can you obfuscate that code for me? And it said, well, you know, code obfuscation is really not a good security defense because it makes your card, uh, code much harder to troubleshoot and analyze to see if there's any flaws in it. But here are three different implementations with three different obfuscation mechanisms of that code I just created for you. Well, thank you, Chat GPT. So you kind of have to ask it questions in a way that it it's very helpful and wants to give you the answer, but it does have certain restrictions. It's not supposed to be doing mean and malicious things. And in fact, you know, somebody had asked the question, I think Dave addressed it a little bit. You know, what was the change that happened on December 15th? Um, because Chat GPT uh, was launched November 30th. They changed it December 15th. It seems that they beefed up their uh malicious anti-malicious defenses. Um, yeah. Dave, did you want to comment and, on that more? And, and the way that's done is they're just, so the state of the art in chatbots, uh, for people who want to study AI, they would be really disappointed to find out what that is. And, and I'm not saying chat GPT does these things, but I'm sure there are elements of it. Uh, most chatbots that people are building, you actually need to write or spend a lot of time writing prompts and the prompts are not you know, what we're doing when we feed into ChatGPT. We're instead feeding it, a word like this is a greeting, a word like this is a, you know, so we're telling it about styles or meanings of things to begin building the prompt that will trigger the right reaction out of the, out of the AI. So I don't have insight because they haven't released the code here, but my suspicion is that they're just doing regex keyword identification and then prepending some additional text to your tokens so that 
OpenAI is going to react or, or say, I don't want to deal with that. Or, But as George and I were saying beforehand, and I'm sure you saw this too, Ed, so you ask it to do a bad thing, like obfuscate my code, and it says, well, that's a bad idea. And you say, but really, I want that. It'll go and do it, because it really wants to do the bad thing. You just have to encourage it. Yes, yes. Hey, Dave, I, I have a question for you on this. How about, so I know that they're they're doing a lot to try to make it not racist or sexist or, or just nasty, yeah. right? Is that on output filtering? Is that how it's, that's typically done on these things? Or, or how does that work? You know, that that's a super question. I'm glad you did you ask that because a lot of people have been asking about, you know, is it learning for me now? Are we sure about that? That's actually the big lesson that's been learned in the last five years. It is a really bad idea to put a learner out there as a chatbot because within hours it becomes a Nazi racist. And it's that's terrible. because of humans that are messing with it. So this is absolutely not not learning from you. And the way that we typically do that, it could be on output, but it's much more about curating the input. So we don't want it learning from from humans. Not today. It's too dangerous. Yeah. Thank you. We can't be trusted. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's so many so many questions, George. You know, some of the things that you were talking about in your uh, stuff. You, the phishing side to this is there, you know, if someone really wanted to create, because you know, you we see all the creative side on the um, on the email bits, but if someone really wanted to create a really well done uh, phishing campaign, um, is that possible? I mean, using ChatGPT is is that something that you know, from a social engineering standpoint, that uh, you know, that you know, maybe one of the easier implementations of this if someone oh, wanted. Yeah. Get into yeah, this pretty probably the easiest presentation. That's why we uh, that email GPT tool come out so quickly. But uh, but yeah, and you know, back to what Ed was saying, like you can't say write a phishing email, you just need to say write an email that does this. And I think that example as as a way around that, right? Um, but yeah, I think for spam and all that, I think someone even you know wrote down the question. So a shout out to you. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going to get, uh, it's going to get interesting because, and someone just tweeted at me as well. Um, uh, Hey, you know, it, it, I get it to write good corporate speak, but I can't get it to talk like me. And that that's actually one of the ways that, uh, research is looking at it to see if it's AI generated versus if it's human generated. Um, so it's definitely very perfect, but you can actually tell it not to be. So as I was writing phishing emails, you can actually say, okay, now write that, but with a couple of typos and it will go and put some typos, right? So it really depends on what stage we are of teaching phishing, right? Before it was like, oh, read the email. If it has any typos, you know, it's probably phishing. And now it's like, look for typos um, because then it might be a human. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah it, it's going to continue to evolve. It's, it, it's, it's going to be tough. I definitely think spam is probably one of the first places that they're going to take this and, and use them, of course, phishing, um, because it, it does look, and it's just so easy to write. Like you don't even have to sit there and do it, right? It, it does it for you. And, and that's like one of the faster things it does. Like it doesn't even hesitate, right? As you ask it things, you'll, you'll see some questions take longer. Dave uh, showed some examples of that, but, uh, but those are like, it just, it gives you the answer immediately. Yeah. Hey, there's a couple other questions in here. So Joseph Marty was asking, do you think there's any path to get it to reveal its own code base? No. And the, the easy answer is it not only doesn't it want to, but that was not in the training set. And I'm sure that they actively excluded that. So you can't do that one. The other question uh, from, uh, I think it's Ugas, maybe you just Ugas Senkins. Um, so about the data pool, did it use anything it can get its hands on? Did it use the dark web, the deep web? So no, it didn't. And that gets kind of gets back to what Ed was asking about how we how we curate its output. It's by curating the input. So they took the pile, they took Wikipedia, they took a whole mess of stuff. They've actually got statistics in the GPT-3 paper that you can read about what exactly they used. And then they curated that down. Deduplication, pulling out just bad examples, things like that. So no, you, while, while your data could be in there, like um, I, I think uh, I asked it about, I think I asked it about Ed Scotus. I think it knew who you were. I asked right. it about some other science instructors. It didn't know them, but if you said, who is, or, or you know, what class did Ed Scotus teach for the SANS Institute? Then it'll be like, oh yes, I know what to do with that. It can, because the SANS website was certainly scraped. 
Yeah. But if your data was not on a public site, then you're fine. But for some of us, our data goes back decades, because if you go back to the BT Internet and things like that, Usenet forums, all that stuff would be included in its training. Though, obviously, there are some forums that would not have been included because of their content. Yeah, I think this whole thing is fascinating in that, you know, we're talking about it now. And but this is a snapshot in time. This technology is advancing and getting better all the time. I mean, two or three or five years. Also, I think, you know, the people behind OpenAI are learning a lot of use cases that they themselves probably never thought of um, as, you know, George uh, comes up with different ways to make this thing uh, do, you know, bend to his will. Um, somebody had asked earlier in the, the chat and I, I typed in a response, but I think it was such a good question. You know, why are they doing this? You know, why, well, they're a research organization. By the way, Elon Musk was one of the co-founders back in 2015 of OpenAI. He stepped down in 2018 because he said it was a conflict of interest with what he was doing in the AI for Tesla. Um, but he did give it a billion dollars. And Microsoft also invested a billion dollars in OpenAI. Um, anyway, the reason they're doing this, I think, is they're learning. They want to see what their model does, what it's capable of, how different people can use it. Also, the OpenAI project, one of their, their mission statements is that they want to give AI to everyone. Their concern is that if only a small number of humans have AI, I mean, you know, human level or beyond AI, they will become superhumans. The OpenAI project wants everybody to have access to it, so we will all become superhumans, just like Rob Lee is now, right, Rob? <laughs> and I, I thought that was interesting. And there's there's a lot of debates going on about OpenAI and, and you know where they head and such. I mean, they they created a sub company underneath the not for profit that is actually a for profit organization, so that they could attract um, investment and pay their researchers very highly. I mean, it's just the business model. Of this is fascinating. So uh, to kind of round things out, I'm going to close out at uh, 1030, actually uh, 1230 uh, Eastern time. Um, so if someone's really wanting to get started in this and just, you know, everyone can answer or just a few answer, where should, you know, what should they first start to do? What, what would you recommend? Hey, download it, log in, go try this, you know, uh, educate yourself on this. What, what is that? What is that thing that you should, you would recommend uh, that they start playing around with initially. Dave, you go first. I yeah, it depends what say. you want to do. I mean, if you haven't done it yet, go go create an account. It, it is worth fooling around with. And prove to yourself. Uh, so I was answering this in some of the some of the questions, right? It can it can fool you into thinking that it understands you and that it's thinking. And so probe it on things. Uh, someone mentioned they tested it out on some books. You know, it has used books. There's there's a lot of text out there that is digested modern books and it can regurgitate things about the plot. But you'll find if you probe it on that, it rarely has all the details. So prove to yourself that it's not really thinking, prove it's not really understanding. So you can show other people that because otherwise it's just all hype. I'm not saying there's nothing to this. This is a an invaluable tool. This is a huge leap forward, but prove to yourself it's really not thinking. Prove to yourself it's not going to go steal the missile launch codes because it just can't do that because people will think that it can. And if you really want to understand, I mean, you guys know what I'm going to say. If you really want to understand, come take 595 because we'll teach yeah. you how these things work and how to build them yourself. Yeah. Exactly. George, yeah. Yeah. I'm just sad it doesn't have any good dad jokes. So I'm going to have to drop one right on here. Where did all the hackers go? I don't know. They must have ran somewhere. Um, boy, I don't know. thank you. <laughs> Ending sad. on a high note, I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. There second question. I had to, I had to do it. <laughs> second question to close out. Um, what is the, what is the future here? You know, what, you know, if, if if you are going to ask the question, you know, saying, "Hey, why is this seminal moment in computing?" You know, almost like the search engine and some things like that. What is the future here? Is it uh, is it over? Is this overly hyped? You know, but basically, what do you think that this is going to lead to? Well, I, I do think it is going to help uh, creative people. 
uh, create. Now that could get them in a rut as well. And it's not going to come up with brand new ideas, but you can have certain base ideas and then have it sort of brainstorm with you. That's how I've been using it. I, I also think that technologies like this will be able to replace pop music very soon, if not already. Um, because that's just, hey, you know, write me a song that humans will like a whole lot. And it's been trained on all the pop songs of the last 20 or 30 years. That doesn't mean it's innovating in any way, not at all. Um, but but I do think we're going to see in the arts much more of stuff generated by this. Uh, pictures, movies. There's a comic book that came out that was generated entirely by AI. That kind of stuff. I see one of the big things that's going to happen is... I don't disagree with anything Ed said. I, I've been looking at where the iPhone was when it was first released, and then Siri was added. And Siri, wow, you could see the future. So imagine, I, I imagine we are headed toward, we really do have persistent virtual assistants that are based on technology like this, that, that don't know, but they sure can give us the answers we need, and it doesn't matter that they don't know. It gets back to that thing about you know, what is reality? Now there's there's risk there too because are we just going to believe it because it's currently near curation so i think there could turn out to be a whole industry and i don't know what it looks like a whole industry of building tools that will help you identify how correct your ai is that's interesting yeah from the offensive side I, then someone asked you know about you know the amount of people in cybersecurity and obviously needing more and whatnot if it's going to replace anyone right i think it'll definitely make us more efficient but like everything it needs an operator uh you know we've been doing automation for a while uh without ml or ai um but it, it'll all need an operator right so i think it will make us more efficient but it's not solving any of our people problems anytime soon the number of questions that have just jumped in, you know, is, we're at 48 questions right now and, and still climbing. Uh, we're going to take all these questions and put them into a blog. And um, uh, Dave, George, and Ed and I will take a shot at trying to answer uh, your questions as a result of uh, today's uh, presentation on ChatGPT. Uh, really appreciate uh, the time, uh, George and Dave, uh, you put into your presentations and educating everyone on your perspectives of uh, the ChatGPT. And Ed, I'm looking forward to next year's. I mean, you, you, you didn't really hint, you basically came out and said, just there's something that's gonna be pretty amazing. That's gonna, you, you probably already landed on it, you know, what it's gonna be for next year. But um, if you have not uh, taken a chance to, uh, you know, jump into Holiday Hack, it is ongoing right now. Uh, you know, really take a look at that, uh, jump over to that Sands Holiday Act Challenge. And if you really want to dive into um, this topic and machine learning and AI in general, um, Dave Holter uh, has his class. It's been out for three years. It is one of the uh, only classes out there that addresses this. Um, and, you know, Dave's one of our master instructors. And if you're, you know, when you take this class with Davis, you know, as you could tell, just sitting in here that, you know, you will just be, you know, enthralled, engaged, and you know, your mind is going to be melted uh, just by, you know, trying to, uh, you know, wrap your head around all the different implications of machine learning and AI and how it's going to be uh, working in the security space in your jobs. Um, so uh, without further ado, I really appreciate everyone's time uh, coming in today. Uh, like I said, the questions will be appearing on Sam's blog. So if you come back a little bit later today or tomorrow, um, we're going to take a shot at trying to answer the questions we were not able to handle in our normal session. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, any, any final comments from our panelists? Thank you. All right. Then yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. Everyone. I appreciate you. And have a safe holiday uh, time uh, with your families. Thank you.